Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and we love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Today I'm here with Eric Jensen, one of the up-and-coming new generation of bespoke tailors that are starting to pop up in New York City. And we're going to be conducting a first fitting for a beautiful uh, dark gray fresco single-breasted suit that he's making for me. Uh, Eric, hey, thank you so much for coming Appreciate to Dallas. Appreciate it, Kirby, very much. Uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see the suit that you're fitting for me. And uh, you're making a, a single-breasted dark gray fresco fabric. Uh, for those that uh, don't know Eric Jensen, and we'll get into a little bit more about your history later, uh, you started uh, apprenticing in Rome, uh, came to Chicago, actually worked with Chris Despis uh, for a little while, and now you just opened your own atelier or workroom in New York City. Yeah, very excited actually. We just opened up in uh, February, February 1 um, on East 28th Street, so we're in the middle of Manhattan now. Yeah, and so it's becoming uh, more and more difficult to find bespoke tailors in New York City, proper bench-made bespoke tailors, just because the old guard, you know, they're all retiring. And so uh, there's probably never been fewer bespoke tailors in New York City than there is right now. Yeah, unfortunately that is the case. Uh, that's why I had to travel to Rome to learn. Uh, a lot of the older guard was not um, teaching. So I um, found a tailor in, uh, in Rome, a maestro, who, uh, who took me on. Yeah, and how many years were you in Rome? So I was in Rome for three years. Uh, I went there at the beginning of 2009 and then I was there until 2012. Okay, and then you came back and that's when you went to Chicago? Yeah, so came back, uh, spent some time reacquiring money and uh, then uh, made my way out to Chicago to finish up my apprenticeship. Okay, great. And then you moved to New York at what, at the beginning of 2018? Uh, yeah, it was actually the middle of 2017. So started working first out of my apartment, and then uh, and then after that, then we just were able to to open up now in yeah. Chicago or well, in Twenty yeah. Eighth Street. <laughs> yeah, well, great. Well, let's see the suit. Why don't you grab that off the uh, off the hook and? So this is a suit. It's a full um, fresco. Um, our style is very Italian. I was trained under Italian um, Mr. Luigi Gallo, who's Roman, but his cut is very inspired by the south of Italy. He was trained under Litrico, who is a very kind of a southern influence as well in his, uh, in his cut and make. So on our coats, um, we usually do no, no shoulder pad, or little to no shoulder pad, little to nothing in the sleeve head as well. Very almost Napoleon in its inspiration. Um, our front dart goes all the way from the chest down to the hem and we cut in two pieces. So we have just a front piece and a back piece. Other people will cut in three pieces, which will be a front, a side body, and a back. Um, so we cut in two. We cut, it creates a more of a draped kind of look, a softer um, Okay, and, and as far as you know, bespoke tailors in New York City are concerned, I mean, you know, you've got Huntsman, which of course is doing the more uh, classically English structured uh, look. You've got some other uh, guys that kind of synthesize, but you know, for someone that's really looking for bespoke Italian kind of Neapolitan soft soft tailoring, uh, I mean, you're you're the guy. Yeah, I'm I'm about it um, that I know of um, in the states and especially in New York. Um, we do everything in-house. Um, we do everything by the standards that I was trained in. So 30,000 stitches, hand stitches in each coat. Yeah. Your collar's hand stitched, your chest is hand stitched. Our lapels are felled by hand, yeah. everything. And it's a fully bespoke, you know, bench-made garment. I mean, you are, of course, you know, the, the bespoke tailor. So, you know, you did Correct. my measurements in New York. You're drafting the pattern. Correct. You know, you're actually, um, you know, striking it, striking the fabric. Correct. Cutting it out. And then, you know, you're also doing a lot of the work yourself, too. Yeah. So I actually do make all the coats as well. So I do the measurements, I do the pattern, I strike, I cut, and fit, and then I also make the coats, and then I have a trouser maker yeah. who makes beautiful trousers. Yeah. And, uh, and that is, I think, one of the most important uh, uh, components of really the bespoke process, you know, that is really missed um, by many, and that is, you know, for something to really be a true bench-made bespoke garment, uh, that it needs to be uh, not only measured by the person making the pattern, but the fittings need to be done by the pattern maker, even if you know it's being sent out to other coat makers to do the construction. I mean, you're offering an even uh, even more involved uh, degree of excellence there because you're doing the coat making yourself. But even if it's being sent out to another coat work a uh, coat maker, uh, having the measurements, the pattern, and the fittings all done by the same person uh, is really the crucible of bespoke tailoring. Yeah, definitely. It it creates that harmony um, with the between the tailor and the client. It also creates the harmony in the workroom 
as well. So what is seen, what the cloth tells the, the tailor on the body mm -hmm. is the same thing that's being translated to the pattern and the, and the adjustments of the pattern that need to happen after the fittings. Mm -hmm. And that all needs to happen symbiotically. Yeah. And if it doesn't, you're, you're shooting in the dark. Yeah. And that interaction between the cloth, the pattern, uh, and then the client is one of the reasons why, you know, even with the best bespoke tailors, you're fitting every single garment is because, again, you've got a two-dimensional pattern, you've got a three-dimensional body, and then you've got this cloth where every cloth is different, every Correct. cloth drapes a little bit differently. Correct. And so unlike shirt making or bespoke shoe making, you know, you, not only do you need fittings with each piece, uh, but really, you know, to do it well and to do it, uh, you know, truly, you need multiple fittings. Yeah, definitely. The... There's aspects and ratios to cloth and the way that the cloth drapes on the body, as you said. Um, you know, the way in which a fresco is going to drape on you is going to be completely different than the way that a, that a uh, flannel is going to drape on you. Some will show more than others, um, will show more defect than others. Um, so every cloth, I always make sure that I try it on the client, at least for one fitting. Yeah. Um, for first time clients, we could do as many as two, three, or even more. Everything. Everything gets fit until I'm satisfied. Yeah. And, and that's the main aspect because you're paying me for your coat and at the end of the day it's your coat and I have yeah. to make sure that you're happy. Yeah, and so stylistically I think you're, you know, although you do have a house style that's very, you know, sa uh, Southern Italian, yeah. right? I mean, Rome, you know, uh, Naples. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you also are a bespoke tailor that can do anything. So, you know, although you might not do a really heavily structured, you know, uh, English, uh, jacket, you know, you can certainly kind of meet in the middle depending on the yeah, client's preference. Yeah, I mean, the, de the details can be within the confines of the, of the preferences of the client. However, my coats will always be soft. They'll always be light. They'll always be easy to wear. And that's, the, that's what I uh, most want to be known for. Yeah. And that's because that's what I find most stylistically Absolutely. appealing and aesthetically appealing. Yeah. Well, I always, I always, you know, people that ask about, you know, how to work with their bespoke tailor, I mean, I think it's so important for there to be really a relationship there. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, as a client going to a bespoke tailor, you know, if you were to dictate the exact measurements you wanted and exactly how you wanted that garment made, then you really take the, the, uh, the magic and the expertise and really the art out of it. I mean, you want the bespoke tailor to really offer, you know, their suggestions and their style and, you know, the, you know, the DNA and kind of the, uh, the essence of that bespoke tailor needs to be manifested through that garment to the client's preferences. Certainly. It's a, it's a relationship, as you said. I equate it to dating um, because, first of all, you date someone you're attracted to. So when you go and find a bespoke tailor, you're attracted to their cut, their fit, their stylistic yeah. ideas. Um, and you date them. And, and that's the relationship in which you, you build off of. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always like to say, you know, once the client and the tailor has had a really great relationship, they get married. Yeah. And that's when all the fun happens. That's when you make really, really fun coats. That's yeah. when you have some ideas and some excitement that come into it. Well, I think piece. that's a great analogy. I mean, you know, I think that a lot of people date around a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, you know, you need to just kind of settle on who your primary tailor is. Exactly. And, and uh, once you get to that point, once you marry, that's when you have the most fun. Yeah. That's when you make some of the most beautiful things. No, absolutely. And I think that, you know, the meaning in the relationship, you know, every single year gets deeper and more meaningful. And not only does that produce a more enjoyable experience for the client and for the tailor, but I think like what you said, it, it absolutely produces better garments. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And the, I as a tailor get more excited of those relationships and usually you end up just really enjoying the work as well. Yeah. So I've got the trousers on. Um, you know, the fresco feels fantastic. Yeah, I mean, so it's a really heavy fresco. It is, it's a 12 ounce fresco. It's um, made by um, Hardy Menace. They're probably the originators of the fresco. They should have a patent on it. They may have a patent on it, I'm not sure. Um, but it's a very great travel cloth for a gentleman like you who's going to travel often, who's probably going to wear his suit while he travels. Frescoes can basically be used like armor. Um, they're, if you hang them correctly, the wrinkles are going to fall out. Um, you can kind of beat them to heck and they're, gonna, they're still going to hold their shape and, and maintain their, um, their tailorability. Um, so it's a great travel trouser, uh, suit actually in general for a gentleman who's going to be traveling. Yeah, great. So, okay, so we've pinned the trousers um, to where he's going to be wearing them. I cut an, a, a more of a normal um, shape on the, or w height on the trousers. So your rise is going to hit right about your navel, mm -hmm. um, which is about where a trouser should sit, um, proper trouser. Um, in this case, for you, we're going to let it out just a little. Uh, maybe a little more than a little. <laughs> a 
Okay. And so is that, I mean, the pleats are opening, so that yeah, will relax so, the front. Yeah, so what we have to do is we're going to let out through the hip and through the waist. And that'll help relax the, the, um, the pleats. This pleat sits cleaner than this pleat, but that just might be the way that it's pinned out. Okay. Um, but on the next fitting, that's something that I'm going to want to look at to see if you have more fullness in one hip than you do on the other. Um, you have a slight low. Yep, you're a little low on this side. Okay, and then if we look at the back of your trousers, um, the seat's clean, but you have a pool kind of pooling up on the back of your um, knees and a little bit underneath the buttocks. Usually that's an indication that you stand a little bit with your hips forward. Most gentlemen nowadays do, so you're in a, in a camp of normality. Um, so we have to change the angle of your seat curve and in order to get the pants to kick back out so that they don't rest on your thighs. And so how much of that is pattern making and how much of that is pressing? That's, mm, that's all pattern making. If, um, if the pattern was correct, the amount of shrinking that we did in the, in the, behind the leg, that should, that should drape cleaner. The fact that it's not draping clean is a pattern issue. Um, it's an angle issue. Um, you, you had mentioned, I believe, something that you felt that the knees were maybe a little... Yeah, I mean, a little tight just whenever I bend the knee. Okay. You know. So in a, in a fresco, you're always going to have a little bit more of a restrictive because it's, a it's more of a tighter weave. Mm -hmm. um, but we will, if you want, I can reduce that or I can let that out. The other thing I wanted to ask is on the hem, do you, do you like that circumference? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is pooling up. Yeah. Um, so we can shorten that as well. And should we do this cupped or uncupped, do you think? It's really up to you and the client. To be honest with you, a lot of people have told me when you have a pleat, you put a cuff with it. But my last tailor, Chris, who I respect his aesthetic, he never liked cuffs. And I began to not like cuffs either. And I feel like they're not necessarily have to, don't necessarily have to be paired, mm -hmm. a cuff with a pleat. Um, so, but again, it's up to you. It's your trouser. It's not my trouser. And so it's really how you feel most represented in, in, yeah. in your bottoms. What I will do, because you smoke cigars, correct? I do. do you always end up with ash in your cuffs? Yeah, I've never checked. Oh, <laughs> see? So most, most people don't allow the cuffs to be taken down, okay. and so you never look inside the cuffs, mm -hmm. but a cuff is a breeding ground for lint and ash, and I smoke cigars as well, and I end up with ash in my cuffs as well, so I'll put a button in it so you can clean them out. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You want that? Yeah, so why don't we do that with like an inch and three quarter turnips? You want an inch and three quarters? So an inch and three quarters, maybe even two inches. Two inches, is, is a, I would go with more of a two inch cuff, okay. especially for more of a, a kind of a modern, more modern look. Yeah. Is going to give you a better cuff in a two inch. So we'll do a two inch cuff and then what else do we need to... So for the most part everything else looks good. Your front's light, nice and clean. We'll shorten them but I don't want to do that now. I want to get the fit right and then I can and then I'll mark the length okay. because if I mark the length now and I have to change something with a fit we're going to be in trouble. Yeah. So I always like to make sure that I, I check your length when okay. we finished. And then we'll do you know just side pockets, Bessem side pockets. Yeah so like mine so Bessem side pocket. Bezum. And then you said... Um, so I like two rear pockets. Okay. The right pocket, I prefer no button. Okay. That way I can slide my phone in and in out of my back pocket quite easily. And then the left pocket, I put a button. Put a button on it. And do you like a um, watch pocket as well? No. Okay. So no watch pocket. Yeah, no coin pocket. No coin pocket or anything like that. Do you wear braces or, um, suspender or um, belts? Um, you know, I don't wear belts, so we would do it uh, with tab trousers. Okay, side tabs. Um, and then... Um, you know, gosh, I'm trying to think, do we cut them for braces? Can you? So because that you are doing side tabs, mm -hmm. um, I'll also put in um, the buttons for the braces and the tabs for the braces as okay. well. And then if you'd like to not use the braces, you can always fold the tabs uh, in and, and put them away. And then you can use your side tabs for adjusting yeah. and tightness. Other than that, I think the trousers are at a good start. Okay, so now that we have the coat on, um, we're going to look at a few things in regards to balance. So we want to make sure that the coat is both, both balanced forward and backward as it is side to side. Um, we also want to make sure that the collar is sitting nice and close and that the, the fronts lie parallel. So when Kirby's standing just normal, we want these fronts to lie 
parallel and clean. So if they were scissoring, that would tell us there's a problem. And if it was um, parallel, it would tell us it's a problem. Yeah. So right now, we've got your coat right now, and it, it's flying nice perfect. and clean. Yeah, nice and clean, nice and perfect. Got a nice roll to it. Um, you're low here. Okay. And the fronts look fantastic in regards to balance. You have a nice shape as well. Um, we'll deal with your shoulder in a little bit. The other thing that we need to do now is take care of the back. So now that we have established that the front has a good front balance, we need to look at the back balance. And so right now we need to look at it and we can see that there's a lot of excess fabric here. There's also a little bit of a pooling down here at his waist. Um, and the collar sits away a little bit on the sides here. What this tells me, Kirby, is that there's too much length in the back mm -hmm. and that you stand more erect, which is more this way towards me, than the coat's cut for. Okay, so what is showing is that your front has perfect length, but your back has too much length. So we need to get rid of that. And I need to know by how much. And so the way that we do that. Is by printing it out. And so this is where you actually start to really um, work the garment on the body. Exactly. And this is the most important part of the job because like I've said I can see you and I can look at you all I want however the cloth is going to tell me what's really wrong with the coat and the cloth on you is going to tell me where those issues are and I've got really prominent shoulder blades too so how do you work through that yeah so you're 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 a, you're a fun client to be honest with you 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 have a round back, which means extra length, but you're also erect, which means you don't need as much length. So right now, as I pin this out, your back is cleaner, or too much. Your back is cleaner now, but now your collar sits low. So we have to add a little bit of length to that, so I need to take out some of this. In regards to your blades, that's done with the iron, so we will actually stretch the cloth for your blades. Yeah, that's where pressing, especially with the bespoke garment, is so important. Yeah, I always tell my clients not to let anybody else press their coats except for me. If it needs a quick little press, you know, something like that, that's fine. But for anything else, I would, I'd rather be the person in charge of that. So with the bespoke jacket, I mean, say that you're not taking it to the dry cleaners, right? So it's not being pressed to the cleaners, um, but it's under normal rotation. Uh, how often does the shape need to be repressed into the garment? if it's not being pressed out by uh, um, cleaners? For the most part, you're not gonna need to, um, to do much work in that regard. Um, so it doesn't like naturally fall out of the garment? No, no, no. When it's pressed in, it's pressed in. Um, the only way that it's gonna lose that shape is if someone takes that shape away um, from the garment. And some of the pressing actually goes into the fabric while it's being made. Correct, yep, especially in your trousers. So in your trousers, will actually shape behind the, behind the, um, the thigh and we'll stretch for the calf and we'll shrink for the shin before it's, before it's even sewn together. And that all happens um, yeah. well before. So that part of the process is, is built in and locked into the trouser. Mm -hmm. You can lose that if someone doesn't know how to press that. Mm -hmm. But again, you're really not going to dry clean your suit maybe once a year because you're not working out in it and you're not doing manual labor in it. Mm -hmm. So you're really not going hopefully. to, yeah, hopefully. So you're really not going to need to dry clean it that yeah. often. And the more you dry clean it, the more you actually yeah. you compromise this. Well, I always say the life of a, any garment can be measured in how many times it goes to the cleaners. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So your shoulders look good. Um, you do still have that, the low side. So So what are you working here? So right now I'm, I'm working on your low side. You're low on your right shoulder. And so what we have to do is we have to eliminate the cloth that's there. So what's happening right now is your shoulder is collapsing mm -hmm. the cloth here. And so we have to lower this. And then when it's on the cutting table, we'll cut out that armhole and drop that armhole as well. But I just need to see how much needs to come out of there. Okay. So this problem is still going to be here until I can hollow out your armhole. Okay. Um, and you cut a high armhole? Yeah. So everything's very, very high. You can feel right up in there. Yeah. So if you stand normal, yeah, you're getting a nice, nice clean up in there. Your sleeve uh, pitch looks nice. 
And the pitch is the rotation? Yeah, so it's the rotation. So what I'm looking for is buildup in the hind arm or, or um, crinkles in the front. That's going to tell me that pitch. And that's also, again, how the, not only is the sleeve cut, but then how it's attached. Yes. You know. So that's going to be ro rotating that. So the, the issues are the buildup here, but the other issue is your collar height. Mm -hmm. And before, when I took that length out, your collar dropped more than I want it to. Okay. Um, so this is why I'm probably going to want another fitting with you, because I'm going to do this. But if this collar height stays as bad, then I'm, I'm going to have to rethink it. And what would that, uh, I mean, you've got enough allowances built in that you, yeah, know, you so can work within exactly. the seam allowances. So it's just a matter of kind of rebasing it together, right? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's the issue. Um, well, that's what kind of what you start with, with why this is a shell like this. There's no pockets built in or anything like that. And the reason behind that is because um, I need to see the way that it looks on you and I need to have full range of change on it, you know, so I can change um, whatever needs to be changed. Yeah, and I guess you, I mean, you'd have to be really way off in order to have to recut the jacket altogether. At this point, yeah, if we were that far off, you should fire me. <laughs> <laughs> and what type of um, lapel do you like to cut? So I've kind of gone from my journey in, in the tailoring world has kind of been expansive. Um, so after I trained in Rome and I came back to the States, I really wanted to cut English because I was so, I'd seen the Italian cut too much. Mm -hmm. So I cut in English suits for myself and I loved them when they were on the mannequins. So structure. Yeah, um, structure. Less belly. Yeah, kind of actually more belly on the lapels. Um, really, really structured in the shoulder and in the chest and the rope on the arm and everything. And they looked great on the mannequin, but I hated wearing them because they were just, they felt like there was too much. Mm -hmm. And so I started ripping everything out of my coats again and going back to the Italians. And I found myself wanting to wear an Italian coat more than an English coat. And so I gravitated to that aesthetically and also as a wearer. So in my coats, I, cut a, I have very light canvas in the chest, very, very light, no flannel at all, no shoulder pads usually, um, no sleeve, nothing in the sleeve head either. I used to cut, so yours is cut like this with a little bit of a belly on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I started cutting more of a straight with no belly on the lapels. Um, that's very kind of a Napoleon style mm -hmm. look to it. And I, I started enjoying it. However, I always let my customers decide yeah. that aspect. And I like this with a belly, actually, to be honest. I think the cloth really lends yeah. itself to that. Yeah, I like the, I mean, not too exaggerated, yeah, right? Yeah. I don't want it to seem, you know, too sprezza, sprezzatura, yeah. but, you know, just a nice kind of elegant yeah. little shape. It, it does give it a nice shape, and it does enhance on the chest as well. And uh, what about the width of lapels? So usually I do about a ten, nine and a half to 10 centimeter lapel. Um, it's a very classic. It's the way I was trained in Rome. Mm. It's just something I'm very partial so to. So where does that sit, though? Is it slightly in the middle? Yeah, yeah, you're shoulder. going to be, it depends, again, again, it's going to depend a lot on the chest mm -hmm. of the client. So with a fuller cl chested client, I'm probably going to give them a little more of a lapel, okay. not to an absurd amount. Mm -hmm. A client like you, who's kind of that, in, that 40 kind of chest, mm -hmm. um, I usually do around a 10, 10 centimeter, and that kind of hits right in, right in there, in okay. that halfway region. That's just a really a kind of beautiful look yeah. in my eye. Mm -hmm. um, usually on my collars, I Compared to what's more common nowadays, and even compared to what the Napoleons are cutting, I would say my gorge is lower okay. um, than them. Again, it's all in the eye of the, of the uh, client. Mm -hmm. I know that one time you had expressed to me that you didn't like so low of a, of a gorge. Yeah. Um, so usually that point right there is about where it's drawn on. Mm -hmm. Oh, even higher. So your drawn on is about right there. So okay. that's actually a really, really nice. It's almost high, but it's not too high. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of a happy yeah. medium. I mean, I don't want it all the way up on the top of my shoulder, no, no, no. but I also don't want it down in like the center yeah, chest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The I mean, pulling me up in terms, right, because the gorge helps also draw the eye and kind of set the balance exactly. visually. Yep. So if it's too low, it seems droopy, Yeah. right? So I guess if you're a really tall person, then maybe you'd move it down a little bit. I don't know. To a two degree, Every, everything's within reason. Yeah. It also, the lapel can define you. It can, can define your coat. A lower lapel gorge is kind of give, give you that 80s, kind of 90s yeah. feel, even harken back to the 30s. Mm -hmm. That higher cut gorge is going to give you more of a modern day yeah. feel. I don't want to be either one because I don't want you, 
I want you to be elegant. Well, you don't want the jacket dated. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I want you to always be elegant. So 10 years from now, you're still elegant. Nice. Exactly. Yeah. So usually I try to find that happy medium between the two. Um, but other than that, I, I quite enjoy the coat. I like the way it looks. Clean up this. I like the drape here in the chest. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'd ask you is in regards to your sleeve head. Um, uh, nowadays, a lot of people in the States especially, they don't understand the Italian sleeve head. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I ask them what they want. I do nothing in it, so you can see kind of the waterfall look to this. Um, or I can do a spalla camicia, or I can add a little bit of a rollino. I don't like to go too much, but I it, it cleans so it. Spalla camicia. What so is? So spalla camicia is actually means a shirt shoulder. Okay. Um, so it is actually based off the shirt. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the shirt, you can see that the cloth is tucked back under, okay. and so you have that line there, mm -hmm. and that's a shirt sleeve collar or shirt sleeve uh, shoulder. Mm -hmm. If you look at most coats, the cloth is pushed out that way. Okay. So it rolls over itself, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if it's pushed in that way, which is it's a shirt sleeve. Yeah. The shirt sleeve shoulder is a very Italian, very Napoleon look. Um, not what I have on here, but I've done them for other clients. I really enjoy them. They're really kind of effervescent way of having a, sh a coat. There's, okay. there's little exaggeration to them. Mm -hmm. They're very simple. Mm -hmm. um, some clients get it, some clients don't. And I don't, put, I don't like to push my sleeve head on anybody. Okay. Um, however, I won't do a big rope, but I will do a soft rope if you want. Yeah. Maybe a soft rope just so that it's not, you know, kind of... Doesn't have the puff to it. The puff. Yeah. 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 Some, some clients don't, don't get that or don't like that, and that's understandable to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, and I think that would look elegant with this kind of yeah. suit as well. And we'll do just normal pockets, you know. Flat, flat pockets. pockets. You know, no slant, no ticket. No, no. Know. And then um, the rest. chest. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's beautiful. Anything else we need to decide here? Today, no. Everything else, um, I mean, from now, the only other thing I'd ask you is your interior pockets, if you have a preference. Yeah, I mean, so pockets on both sides. Okay. You know, a pin pocket right here. Okay. And then something the here for, like, pocket. business, yeah, business cards. It, yeah, it was a cigarette was pocket a cigarette. at one time. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Everything else is... Yeah, and then, um, so what's next then? So you've taken the measurements, or you've taken the measurements, you've done the first fitting, you know, you've marked that up. Um, where do we go from here? Sorry, I just want to make sure that's fine. Um, so right now, what I'll do is I'll take this back, I'll break it down, mm -hmm. and I'll make the adjustments that I've pinned out of it. Okay. Um, we'll put the pockets in, we'll put the lining in, we'll put the facings in, okay. and everything. Everything will pretty much be finished, aside from your shoulder, collar, and sleeves. Okay. And that's where we'll do our next fitting, because I really want to see if that adjustment that I made to your back is correct. Mm -hmm. um, once so you're really going to build out the, the structure here. You're going to pad stitch, pad stitch you know, yeah. the lapel. So the lapels will be pad stitched. Put the facing on. Put the facing on. Finish out the interior. Finish out the interior completely. Mm -hmm. We'll baste up the sides, and then um, we will also baste on the sleeves and baste on the shoulders and baste the collar on. Okay. So other than that, every part will be finished besides those minor okay. things. And that way, when we do our next fitting, I can make sure that the adjustments that I made with you today mm -hmm. are going to be were correct. You know, and if they're correct, then we move on to final phase. Yeah. If they weren't correct and I need to adjust a little more, I might ask to see you one more time. Mm -hmm. It really is going to depend on that next yeah. phase. And so how much work is between this phase and the next one? Seems like significant. It's significant, yeah. You're looking at probably about 75% of the work would be finished. Okay. Um, yeah, so. And how many hours is that approximately? The finished suit takes about 60 hours of hand work. Okay. Yeah, so you're looking at about 30,000 hand stitches, give or take and you're looking at about 60 hours of it. So if you were to do it from start to finish, you're looking at a full week. Yeah, you're working at about two weeks, 80, 80 hours. Okay. It would probably do start to finish, if we're including the trousers. trousers. Yeah, you're looking at about 60 to 80 hours of work. Great, well I can't wait to, to see it. I mean, I love the dark gray, kind of heavy fresco. I, I mean, think it's, it's gonna look gorgeous on it you. It'll be a nice, versatile suit. Exactly, you, know. you can wear it anytime. Yeah, and I find myself going back to the blacks more often. Yeah. You know, the grays, the darker colors. It's always a question that I always ask my clients is what do, you, what do you feel more formal or comfortable in, blues or grays? Because gentlemen that feel better in blues usually don't feel better in grays, and gentlemen that feel better in grays don't feel better Yeah, that's an interesting way to think of it. I definitely skew towards the grays. Yeah, and I'm a blue guy. So. Really? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, anyone that's interested in um, you know, getting in touch with you, Eric, I mean, what's the best way to reach out? Where can they find you? So you can find us on our website, sartoriajensen.com. Uh, Sartori is indicative of how I was trained in the cut that I make, which means bespoke in Italian. Yeah. You can also find us on Instagram at Sartoria Jensen. Mm -hmm. And then um, through just sartoriajensen.com, you can see our work. We do women's work as well and then you can contact us through via there. Yeah, and you're in New York, so yes. you have your, your showroom on the 21st Street, you on said? On 28th Street, yes. So we're on 118, 28, East 28th Street. Yeah. Um, little studio, it's a great place. You can see your coat being made, and you can come for fittings or you can come for drinks, e yeah. either way. Great. Yeah. Hey, Eric, thank you so much Such for coming to Dallas for this, and I can't uh, wait to see uh, this jacket really take yeah, shape. Yeah, I'm real excited. Thank you, Kirby. Okay, cheers.